Welcome back to Mornings with Dave King and Matt Martin. We are broadcasting from the Thacker Jewelry Studios. We use loose diamonds, custom design, and more at thackerjewelry.com. We want to go directly to the phones. We've got Scott Braddock, editor of the Quorum Report on line two. Scott, how, uh, are you ready for a weekend? Let's have a weekend already. That would be good. <laughs> a weekend with football? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, if you're going to watch it. With football, protests, uh, you name it, we've got it all. <laughs> we've got to have it all. Uh, sure. Scott, thanks for coming on. Uh, we've got a lot to talk about. The The big thing for me is the governor, I, I don't, number one, it, it bothers me a little bit mm-hmm. that the governor apparently thinks he's writing legislation because all of the news news outlets that I've read this from are saying the governor is introducing legislation. The governor should not be introducing legislation. Uh, well, the governor can do that in a, in a, in a way. Right, he has to go the, through someone the, else, well, right? Wait, right, uh, so a legislator would actually have to file a bill, but but here's something he's doing that um, that he hasn't really done uh, a lot of in the past, and um, you know I wonder what you think. Uh, look, the governor has for the entire time he's been in office since he you know first was sworn in back in 2015, he's often been accused of not doing the hard work, um, you know, leading up to a legislative session to try to build uh, consensus around various proposals. I'll give you an example. Remember in the last legislative session when there was a meltdown uh, about his proposal that uh, the speaker and the lieutenant governor were quick to um, support the proposal to increase the sales tax, uh, and it just came in the middle of the legislative session, and there had been no discussion about that leading up to it uh, whatsoever. And I remember KFYO listeners were not happy about that proposal at all. Um, you know, and you, you looked around the state, and conservative uh, voters were very angry about that. And they were saying to the governor and others, "You never before said you were going to do do anything that had to do with raising taxes of any form, whether it was sales taxes, property taxes, etc." Uh, and as you remember, that proposal just completely fell apart. It flamed out and didn't work. Um, the governor right now is. In a, you know, in the estimation of a lot of people, and it's interesting the the coalition, sort of loose coalition that's come together against him. I hear a lot of conservatives who say that he's sort of grasping for straws right yeah. now uh, with some of these proposals. Uh, and we've talked about this on some of the other stuff that had to do with, um, you know, punishing quote unquote punishing cities for defunding police. And then I also hear um, liberals and Democrats say something very similar. They say, well, he's you know trying to change the subject from his coronavirus response, and I don't hear a lot of conservatives disagree with that assessment from Democrats, right? Because um, if the subject of the election is the response from the state and the federal government to the coronavirus, I think there are a lot of incumbents who are going to lose. Uh, You know, if it's a referendum on how we've done here as far as state leadership's response to COVID-19, people are giving that a big thumbs down, right? Um, This is something where um, I think the governor and his uh, team and, you know, Republicans around him uh, those, those are at the top. They're sort of making the bet that almost everybody, Republicans and even some folks who might lean toward Democrats, might say, well, everybody loves the police, and we got to rally around them, and that's what he's trying to do. Yeah. Well, w- uh, so as far as the, the, I guess, the meat of this, uh, is is there any possible way anything like this is going to pass? I mean, I, I look at what we're talking about we're talking about uh specifically it seems he seems to be talking about Austin but we're talking about large cities if they defund their police uh, essentially as far as i can tell at all i mean we don't have a percentage here that's right uh, if they defund their police at all you're talking about now uh, according to what he's talking about it could be um you, those that had been annexed previously mm-hmm. can now uh, he's i think they said de-annex but you're essentially talking about cessation secession from that uh, oh, right. that city. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the governor now is saying, and previously he had said that um, any city that quote-unquote defunded its police would see its property tax revenues frozen, which, as you remember, some activists immediately said, well, that would be great if property taxes were frozen. How is that a punishment? Uh, and then uh, yesterday he you know, rolled uh, out this deal to, uh, to punish quote-unquote cities by um, you know, taking away their annexation power, which, of course, annexation is a, it's a real uh, controversy, especially in bigger cities uh, where this happens more uh, around Houston and San Antonio in particular. Um, but one thing that you hit on there that's ab- absolutely key, Matt, is the governor, if you listen to his press conference yesterday, he went out of his way and took great pains to not answer any specifics about the thing you brought up, which is how, what does that mean to defund the police? Does 
does that mean if you cut the police budget by one dollar, does that mean that these um, these quote unquote punishments would kick in? Um, when he's asked about that, uh, he will absolutely not answer that question. And, and one of the things he said uh, during his uh, news conference yesterday uh, was that that's what a legislative session is for to try to hammer out those kind of details. <laughs> Of yeah, course. We'll keep it vague for right now during uh, the campaign season. Uh, but look, this is, re- I mean, um, at the end of the day, this is really, let's get down to brass tacks. Why are they actually doing this? Why, are, why is Republican leadership talking about this? Um, it's because Democrats are suddenly, and when I say suddenly, I mean in the last two or three years, you have to go back to the 2018 um, election to see actual results and not just these poll numbers that we've been seeing you know, over the last few months where it looks like Democrats are more competitive, especially at the national and at the top of the ticket sort of level, you know, in the U.S. Senate race and the presidential race and all that. But in those Texas House races, um, there is a real fear among Republicans that Democrats are going to do well in suburban areas like Collin County, Denton County, Tarrant County, Fort Bend County, etc. Um, and if you ask people in those communities, and I think the same thing is true in rural Texas, if you ask people in Lubbock County, for example, are you in favor of defunding the police? You know, that poll would come back 90-10 no, right? No, nobody's in favor of that. And in the suburbs, it's probably 70-30 no, at least. Um, and so Republicans are sending a clear message to suburban voters, and you see this all the way from the top, where the president's talking about law and order, in response to some of these, um, you know, violent protests in some places around the country, even though most of the protests in the wake of the death of George Floyd had been peaceful, we do have those uh, that have been, uh, you know, absolutely out of line. And then, you know, in some of those places where uh, there has been violence, that has to stop. And you do hear uh, folks like former President Obama, Joe Biden, and others finally sort of saying, you know, those sorts of violent protests have to stop. The violence can't be the answer. They're getting the message that they can't be on the side of these violent protesters. And after the after uh, the governor uh, put this um, put this pledge out to back the blue, uh, if you will, which I think he did on Wednesday ahead of his Thursday news conference, uh, you had the Texas House Democratic Caucus chairman come out and say, "Look, we don't know of anybody uh, who's running for the legislature who is in favor of defunding the police, not on the Republican or the Democratic side." What a lot of people have talked about that even some Republicans do agree with and this is why it matters how you talk about this stuff, is police reform. Uh, you know, the, and, and as Governor Abbott said yesterday, in some cases what police need is better training, and that may need more funding, not less. Um, but, look, we're 30 days away just, I mean, just about now from uh, early voting, and this does seem to be the closing argument from the Texas Republican leadership. They're just simply saying to voters, they're trying, trying to put a clear... Uh, message a clear question in front of voters in the suburban areas. Are you in favor of sticking with the cops, backing the blue, or not? And you hear it from the governor, the speaker, and the lieutenant governor all signing this pledge. So Austin, Texas, in my opinion, has has made uh, multiple mistakes over um, uh, actually hurting the the part Democrat Party, which you think uh, so. It, well, and and I'll, <laughs> I I want to yes, ask sir. you know they they've allowed Absolutely. homeless to just uh, essentially live in the streets. Uh, and pop up tents uh, on sidewalks. They've, and then they they give this gift uh, to the to, to the Republicans. Yep. Uh, very um, publicly gave this gift to the Republicans as far as defunding their police. Mm-hmm. Um, do you see in Austin? Do you see any movement uh, of change in the city council there? Uh, no, not at this point. Um, and I think you hit the nail on the head. Um, anytime Republican leadership in Texas is running out of winning arguments, they can always count on Austin City Hall to, to you know to come up <laughs> Here's with something. Here's a few gifts that, for you. Yes, that that that, pe- that people across the state would think that everybody who lives uh, where I live here in Travis County is just crazy or something. Um, you know, if you look at what uh, the city council did in Austin when it comes to police funding, it's not maybe as radical as some people uh, have made it out to be. Although. It is a move, um, you know, uh, toward taking some funding away from police. But keep in, per- keep in mind, um, the original proposed budget for the Austin Police Department for the coming year uh, was over $400 million, um, and they took $20 million away from cadet classes and some overtime pay, things like that. And then other funds was, were going to be moved toward um, other forms of public safety. So it's not quite as crazy as, uh, as some folks make it out to be. But, but it's a political season, and I'll tell you, um, it's not new that uh, the facts and truth are usually the first casualty in a campaign. So uh, 
uh, we're running. Uh, we're we're talking way too much, I guess. But we're running out of time. Can can we hold you over? Can I go ahead and take a quick break and hold you over until the till uh, eight thirty? I'm oh, happy to. Sure. All right. Mm-hmm. We've got to take a quick break. We'll be back with the editor of the Corn Report, Scott Braddock, on News Talk ninety five point one FM seven ninety AM KFYO. Welcome back to Mornings with Dave King and Matt Martin. We're going to go back to the phones with Scott Braddock, the editor of the Quorum Report. Um, Scott, one of the things that uh, that's out there, kind of news, is that uh, Ted Cruz is going to be on the list, short list of Supreme Court nominees. Mm-hmm. Uh, do you think that's actually going to hurt or help Donald Trump? Um, one of the things that I think put uh, the president over the top in the first place in 2016, and I think something that, and you may have seen this from, uh, your listeners, and just anecdotally, and I think you see this in polling as well, you know, you did have all those never-Trumpers out there who, you know, at one point, the people who called themselves never-Trumpers in 2016, they were supporting people like Ted Cruz, right, right. Um, you know, for president. Um, and it's the judicial nominations and confirmations that have really put uh, a lot of evangelicals and sort of traditional conservatives, constitutional conservatives, in the corner of the president, right, because they had uh, a lot of misgivings about, uh, you know, some of his history of, uh, you know, supporting, I mean, let's be honest, some more liberal causes and being a, a political contributor to Democrats, et cetera, uh, over the years. It was only a fairly, uh, you know, a recent thing that President Trump even became a Republican. I still don't um, think he's that Republican, to be honest. Right. It, certainly a different kind of Republican, right? Um, but one of the things that people like Cruz and others have said is that they like the results under President Trump. They like the right. fact that he cut taxes. They like the fact that he's put conservatives on the bench um, and that he wants exactly. to continue to do that. Uh, one of the immediate questions I was asked uh, when this uh, list was released, and you see Ted Cruz there, some people asked, well, doesn't Ted Cruz have a problem with the very people who would have to give the thumbs up or thumbs down to a nomination for the Supreme Court? You know, Doesn't he not exactly play well with others in the United States Senate? Um, you know, there's a lot of aggravation uh, with Senator Cruz, even among some of his Republican colleagues. But, you know, my thought was just that um, two things. One, um, if the question is whether you would want a conservative on the court, Cruz would simply be a reliable conservative vote on right. the court. Um, and I think all of his Republican colleagues know that, and so do the Democrats. And the other thing is for those uh, senators who uh, don't like him as a senator, they might just vote to confirm to not have to see him every day in the Senate. <laughs> just to get rid of and him. And that's sort of only, uh, only half-joking well, about that. I, I, well, I guess my thoughts were, uh, if you look back at um, senators in Texas and and those who have been voted uh, and, and polls, and, and even when he uh, was in his election, he got elected with by a slim margin, much smaller than you would expect in the state sure. of Texas. And and I, I was just wondering when I saw his name up there, is is that going to help Donald Trump or could it potentially hurt him with uh, Ted Cruz when, when you look at how unpopular he is by some people? Yeah, and I continue to think that this election in Texas may be Um, what you might call a skin-of-the-teeth election for Republicans, and it goes right to what we were talking about uh, in the first segment at the top of the hour, uh, you know, with this message about supporting the police. Um, You know, it's something where Republican uh, leaders want to shore up their support in the suburbs, which have emerged as the real battleground in Texas. Um, I think it's a battleground all over the United States right now. Absolutely, and, uh, you know, when you look at the potential nomination of Cruz, you had so many people who, again, it's anecdotal, but uh, were saying things like, you know, I can't have that liberal in office. So they're talking about Beto O'Rourke. Right. And even if even if they weren't the biggest fan of Cruz, and this was an actual quote from uh, Jerry Patterson, the former uh, land commissioner here, Republican, uh, who said that he was no fan of Cruz, but uh, he certainly couldn't stomach the idea of Beto O'Rourke being the United States senator. He said what he did was he went into the voting booth, he voted for Cruz, and then he came out and stuck his finger down his uh, throat and threw up. Yeah. All right. Uh, always, co- always colorful, Jerry Patterson. Yeah. So we've got we we have a Senate race right now going on um, between uh, I believe it's M. J. Hagar and and I know, I've heard her name a lot. I don't know that much about her, but we also have uh, Senator John Cornyn. Um, I know that the the polls seem to be tight, but do you think uh, Hagar has any chance at all of beating John Cornyn? It's an interesting race for multiple reasons. Sean Cornyn has been the United States Senator uh, for Texas for, I think we're in 18 years of that so far. It's, it's been a while. 
uh, and he's uh, largely unknown to a lot of people when you look at polls. Um, you know, he's not a firebrand like Cruz. He doesn't have the same kind of uh, national, um, you know, prominence that Cruz has, uh, which Cruz, uh, you know, accomplished. I mean, give him his, uh, his due in a fairly short amount of time. I mean, Cruz is only in his second term as a senator. Right. Um, and if you look at some of the television ads that are running right now, uh, Hager is, uh, you know, promoting the fact that. Uh, you know, she was a fighter pilot, uh, shot down, uh, you know, in the theater of war and all of that. It's a pretty dramatic story. Um, and Cornyn is focusing in on some things that are not exactly uh, partisan red meat. I mean, one of the ads I saw from him yesterday had to do with uh, a bill that he sponsored to try to address the backlog of rape testing kits to try to help women. Mm -hmm. Uh, so trying to shore up his support with women, particularly in the suburbs, which we've been talking about. Right. Um, and really, you know, but not anything that's really breaking through just yet, and time's mm -hmm. running out. Yeah. All right, well, Scott, thank you so much for coming on. We've run out of time. Um, Scott Braddock, editor of The Quorum Report. Go check out The Quorum Report at quorumreport.com. Uh, see what they have going on there. And, Scott, uh, we'll talk to you again in a week.